Okay. Um, so, um, hey everyone, I'm Justin Newhart. I'm the city's historic preservation officer and um, Jamie D'Angelo is gonna join me in presenting on what we do in preservation and design. She's our senior planner um, over the stockyards and um, she also spends a lot of time helping out in preservation as well. Um, so what I thought we would do today is kind of go over um, why preservation and design is important in Fort Worth or in to Fort Worth. Um, some of the things we look at, because I know a lot of you end up touching some of the projects that we work on in, in various ways um, what, during your day, and um, some, some things that you all can look out for when you're reviewing projects in our historic and design districts. So, um, these are where all of our design and the historic districts are located throughout the city of Fort Worth. Most of them are in the inner city. Um, they were put in place mainly to kind of conserve and reinstate um, specific architectural character found in certain districts throughout the city, like in downtown, Camp Bowie, um, the near south side, Morningside, Carver Heights. Um, usually these districts are created by the people who live in them, um, whether they're property owners or residents, they are the people who want these historic districts and want to see their neighborhoods conserved and um, look the same that they have for the past 50 to 100 years. We do have some overlay districts. Um, you can see the one that goes up along I-35 North. Those are really to um, kind of regulate new construction to make sure it has a um, similar look and feel up and down the corridor um, from an architectural and uh, landscape and urban planning, urban design standpoint. Um, Historic design and form based code districts are important because they protect existing historic uh, existing cultural resources. They encourage compatible development like this building here, which is on um, South Main Street in the near south side. And you can see it looks very similar to the 2 historic brick buildings um, behind it in the background. It helps maintain and stabilize property values. We saw during um, the last great recession during 2008 that. Uh, Property values in historic and design districts actually stayed the same and increased a little, um, and they didn't lose value because um, there were those protections in place from a historic uh, and design district standpoint. Um, these districts promote uh, pedestrian friendly public spaces, which you can see in this photo right here. We have great sidewalks, street trees, on street parking, um, and they reinforce a district's existing context. So. And a lot of our inner city neighborhoods, there's um, a lot of existing buildings and we want to make sure that new construction that goes in is compatible with um, the historic structures up and down our streets. Each of our design districts has design a set of design standards and guidelines, and they are very important uh, because if we don't have design standards in our districts, we end up getting new construction like you see in this photo which is highly incompatible with the two historic structures next door. Um, so we, through the intent of our, a lot of our design standards and guidelines is to make sure that one, existing structures are treated appropriately when they're rehabilitated, and two, that new construction is compatible. And I'll, I've got another slide later on in the photo or in the presentation. Um, where you can see more of a compatible new new development next to historic structures. I have a quick question. Can you hear sure. me? Yes. Is there any way to control that or do the neighbors complain or how does that work? In terms of new uh, construction? Uh, you've got these old, yeah, you have these older houses here and then this new one in the middle that's completely different. Um, do the neighbors have any resources about that or how does that work? Yes, so any new construction in a historic district has to be reviewed by the Historic and Cultural Landmark Commission, which is one of the boards and commissions that our group runs. Um, that's a public meeting, just like zoning commission or board of adjustment where residents can show up, write letters or call in and um, voice their opinions on these development projects in our historic districts. Um, in urban design districts, if a project needs a waiver from the design standards for that district, then that project has to go to the Urban Design Commission for review. Um, 
which is another public board that we run. And that's where the public can offer comment and provide feedback on, um, on these projects. Thank you. Yep. So for each project that we review, we issue a certificate of appropriateness. I'm sure you all have seen these at some point um, on a permit. They are an official approval from either our staff or the Historic and Cultural Landmarks Commission that allows a project to proceed. Um, the reason we issue these and the reason we provide a lot of detail is that uh, in the scope of work is that these projects are you know, reviewed by the Landmarks Commission, which is appointed by City Council. And they have to meet the design standards of a district, which have to comply with local, state, and federal laws. Um, and so we, we have to be very specific and clear about what type of work is going on so that the, the project is in compliance with uh, legal standards and guidelines for preservation and design. Um, we really get into the details with uh, new construction projects and rehabilitation of historic homes. Um, here's an example, a recent example of one that was in the Morningside Historic District, which was not constructed according to the approved plans and which um, caused us a significant amount of staff time to kind of uh, get back to a point where it was compatible with the surrounding architecture. So you can see the actual building form is different. The windows don't look the same. They weren't installed correctly. The roof form is different. The porch isn't in the right place and they have paved the, almost half of the front yard. Um, so all, all of these were um, issues that were inconsistent with the set of approved plans that went to, his, went to the Historic and Cultural Landmarks Commission. And so if you all are ever on a permit or reviewing a project in a historic district, um, please pay attention to the details like, um, like you see um, here on this slide because it really makes it easier for us when the projects are constructed uh, correctly and they're in accordance with the approved plans. We also look at um, things such as site paving. Um, this is another new construction project in historic Carver Heights. Originally, we had approved just this uh, simple um, single loaded driveway from the street. And what was constructed was um, a large parking pad in the front yard. And it took us about eight to nine months to um, work with the contractor to get them to remove that extra paving and bring the um, paving on site into compliance with uh, the original site plan that was approved. And, you know, it, it's uh, led to a lot of um, negative feelings with the customer and the new property owner and the contractor. And, um, um, you know, it's really important that when um, they're not, a, when people build projects that we inspect everything, not just from, you know, the houses, but also to the site paving as well. Windows are really important. It's where we spend most of our time as staff in terms of compliance and um, making sure the details are correct. This is a wood window on a historic building. It has very distinct features, such as two operating sashes, a windowsill, um, a specific trim, and you can see there's a lot of um, shadows and light from all of those different features that really give it a lot of character that you don't get from vinyl windows these days. Um, and when we look at new construction, we wanna make sure that even if you're using vinyl windows, that they're installed appropriately so they have those, um, they have similar design um, and details as original wood windows. So this is a recent new construction in Terrell Heights. As you can see, uh, these vinyl windows do not look uh, very close to the original wood window in design. Um, and this ended up being a compliance case and we couldn't final the building permit until the windows were corrected. So. Um, this is a this is another example from Terrell Heights where the vinyl windows were installed correctly and you can see they have a lot of the similar details to that original wood window where they're recessed into the wall plane they have projecting window sills and appropriate trim so um, if you're if you're ever dealing with uh, new construction in a historic district and you have questions about how windows are supposed to be installed please give us a call we're happy to help um, because 
we want to make sure they get it right the first time so they don't have to go back and fix, you know, 10 to 15 windows that they had just recently installed um, and put siding on. Setbacks are important in historic districts. Most of our historic districts have houses that are have a setback of anywhere from 10 to 15 feet from the property line. And you can see that here in the bottom photo where you have a, a, a historic home that is set very close to the sidewalk. And um, this is kind of um, antithetical to some of our requirements of the zoning ordinance where the minimum setback is 20 feet from the property line. Uh, in historic districts, we want to make sure that any new construction is consistent in terms of its placement on site with historic structures next door so that you have a uniform streetscape up and down, uh, up and down the block. Um, here you can see the new construction is set a little bit farther back than the historic house next door. And it looks kind of odd from the street because it doesn't have the wall plane on the same plane as the historic structure. So. Um, we want to make sure um, that you know details such as setbacks are are followed when um, these houses are built. Raised foundations are important. Um, these are uh, often not constructed um, in new construction throughout the Metroplex in Texas because no one wants to pour a raised foundation. They want to do slab on grade um, and get in and get out real quick. But in historic districts, um, historic homes often had a raised foundation like you see on the right because they had pier and beam foundations, um, which helped uh, with a variety of things in terms of energy performance and the building performance. And so for new construction, we ask that property owners uh, raise the foundation up at least two steps, which you can see here on the left with the new house. So they have those same porch characteristics um, and foundation characteristics as historic homes up and down the street. Um, if you guys are ever working on a prop, prop project in a historic district or a permit, um, please remember that, you know, the plans must match the approved plans by staff or the Landmarks Commission. Um, any changes have to be reviewed by our team before they can proceed in the field and um, details matter. And you can see in this photo, this is another block in Terrell Heights, one of our historic districts. The two houses on the right are new construction and they are very compatible in terms of scale and design with the historic structure next door, even though it's not in the best shape. So when we get the details right on, on these types of projects, it really helps reinforce that historic character in, in our historic and design districts. And now I'm going to turn it over to Jamie for the next couple of slides. So we've talked a little bit about how we um, regulate properties in historic districts and what the purpose of those are. And I'll talk a little bit about our form based districts um, and the elements that we're trying to regulate there in our form based districts. We, um, in addition to land use, we regulate aspects of architecture. So vertical construction um, materials roof shape, percentage of fenestration on the portions of the building that face towards the street. And one of our biggest items is our, um, essentially our frontage zone around the property. So how does the building meet the street? What is the treatment of the sidewalk and the landscape buffer adjacent to the sidewalk? Are there street trees? Are there trash bins? Are there seating areas? Are there pedestrian lights? We get we um, we require pedestrian lights in I think most if not all of our form based code districts um, and this is really what what makes these areas I think pretty different from the standard zoning um, the the parts of our city that have standard zoning we just have higher expectations um, for where the building meets the street and really specific standards that new construction needs to meet a lot of um, rehab projects um, and some additions in form based districts do not require the full um, set of streetscape improvements. So if it's just a rehab or like a facade remodel, you don't have to meet these criteria. It's sort of an existing condition situation. But in general, that's the um, those are the I think some of the most visible improvements that you're seeing 
with the standards that we have in our design districts. Um, you can go to the next slide. Okay. So um, one of our, I would say, combination design district and historic district is the stockyards, as Justin mentioned earlier. The stockyards, the core of the stockyards has been a national register district since 1976. And when the stockyards form based code was adopted in 2017, it created a historic district at the core and then two um, form based code districts that kind of um, are adjacent to it and um, move out from the center. So it's a way of protecting the historic core and then ensuring that um, development on adjacent sites as you move out from the center of the stockyards is stylistically compatible, is protecting view corridors in the stockyards, is made of compatible materials, and is sort of overall protecting the stockyards like look and feel as a tourist destination um, because it is it is very unique. So it's that's why it has that code. So one of the biggest projects um, that has come through the stockyards in the last couple of years under the new code was the renovation of the mule barns, the historic mule barns um, and mule alley, which was repaved, landscaped, um, new commercial entities came in, those large, like formerly agricultural holding pens were converted into storefronts. Um, and this really activated that um, connection point with exchange, Mule Alley goes from exchange down to the new Hotel Drover. Um, and, and it is all, you know, it was a conversion of an existing historic building that was consistent with the code. Um, and I think it's a good example of how um, that is achievable, even if the code is, is very particular. Um, it's, for, it's for a good reason. So you can see a lot of the elements that I mentioned earlier, the landscaping, the bulb outs, the um, street trees, um, appropriate lighting. We re also review signage in this district as well um, to make sure it doesn't overwhelm the facade of the historic building. Um, so it, uh, yeah, Justin, I think that was a good project selection to highlight that code and um, at work. Um, why are waivers often encouraged in design? So in our form-based code districts, um, if a project is um, exceptional or unusual or is solving a problem in a really creative way, we do like to encourage developers to request um, that exception at the Urban Design Commission. Um, Form-based codes really encourage contextual design and the waiver process allows um, developers to achieve that if they're doing something really unique. We also don't charge fees for our applications either for um, Landmarks Commission or the Urban Design Commission. So um, at least from that perspective, there is no, uh, like if a, if a developer wants to ask for a waiver at the Urban Design Commission, there's, um, other than time, there's not really a, a risk to them. They can go and be heard um, and, and have their project reviewed. Um, so we can't really plan for every, every site um, we need to be contextually sensitive and the waiver process does allow us to, to explore that. We, um, so this is different from our, the way we approach waivers in historic preservation. In our form-based code districts, we're dealing with new construction usually um, where we get to plan sort of with the developer from the ground up how that new project is going to best meet um, the standards of the district. Historic districts are about protecting historic buildings and the integrity of those historic buildings. So um, in general, <laughs> we're going to request and the standards are gonna request that you retain as much original material as possible, that you don't change original features, and that if you must um, repair and replace, that you repair and replace with compatible materials. So um, in general, it, we, we have processes to request those waivers, but our preservation ordinance um, does not give the Landmarks Commission as much leeway um, as the Urban Design Commission to grant waivers. Um, the Urban Design Commission can grant a waiver if um, the project is meeting the intent of the subdistrict. Um, under our preservation ordinance, really waivers are only appropriate if um, there is a is the applicant is severely cost burdened 
in making the correction and they can show that, or if the work is technically infeasible. So if they've, if something has happened to the property and it, it's basically impossible to uh, reverse it back to what it was um, safely, <laughs> um, then those are the criteria we can consider. But yeah, the, the aims of these two districts are, are different. And so the waiver process reflects that. Code of compliance. Um, we, especially in the historic districts, we do spend quite a bit of staff time on um, asking individuals and owners to correct work um, that they've already done, that they haven't um, gone through our office for review for. Um, this is really, this is, this can be tough because it's, um, if the if the owner has already done the work to replace windows or replace a door or um you know do something that is is quite an expensive for them you know home remodel and we come in and tell them to correct that um we're already kind of operating at a loss like the homeowner's not happy about it the work's not consistent it's not um you know it's it's taking away from the character of the district and so we really try to work with these folks um, to give them time to make the corrections, to really be clear about what the corrections need to be. Um, but it, if we really, if folks understood um, the district standards a little better and a little earlier, then we would have, we hope, less code compliance cases. So we're trying to do a bit more outreach when we get our new planners so that we spend less time dealing with code compliance cases and more time um, getting ahead of people's projects and letting them know kind of the resources that they need to be successful in that in that remodel or that rehabilitation. So one of the ways we can help property owners either make those repairs or rehabilitate their structures um, is through financial incentives. Um, a lot of the time, the uh, complex work associated with rehabbing a building costs a little bit more because you're working with older building materials and you need um, skilled labor in a way that you don't necessarily need on new construction projects. So, um, from, the, from the city's perspective, we offer the historic site tax exemption um, to kind of help homeowners recoup the cost of rehabilitation after the project is complete. Um, it freezes the taxable value of the property at pre-renovation levels for 10 years after the project is done. And so homeowners can get some of that um, rehab money back over time as their tax bills are reduced throughout the length of the exemption. For commercial properties, um, there are federal and state preservation tax incentives where you can end up getting um, up to 45% of your project costs back on a rehabilitation project. Um, they're very, very lucrative and they're very, um, they really make projects work like this one that you see here on the, uh, in the photos. This is the Meisner Brown funeral home on the east side near Texas Wesleyan. Um, it was a city owned property up until about 2015, 2016. And the former HPO and preservation staff worked with historic Fort Worth and the community to find a, a buyer who could actually save and rehab the building. And today, what you see at the bottom of the screen is now what it looks like. It's a beautiful event space. Um, there's also office space in there, and it's a great asset to that community around Texas Wesleyan. So if you all haven't had a chance to go over there and see it, I highly recommend it. Um, this, this project used our local tax incentive and federal and state tax credits to make the project work. We're working on a, a few major projects currently. Uh, one of them is the historic resources survey update. Um, our current resources survey, which tells us where all of our historic um, properties are throughout Fort Worth, as well as historic districts, dates from the um, early 1980s, so it's older than I am. And mm. We are, it's very out of date and it's going to take us about 17 years to completely update the survey. So we're going to chip away at it each year. Uh, the current phase calls for a resurvey of the um, historic Terrell Heights um, historic district, as well as the near Southeast National Register district, um, also known as the historic South side. We don't have much survey data 
or, or any survey data, to be honest, in this district. So um, this phase of the survey will help us with land use and planning in this historic district, which is about to see a lot of pressure from new commercial development associated with the large Hope Global Development, as well as the uh, National Juneteenth Museum and other projects up and down the Evans and Rosedale corridor. So it's really important that we have accurate data on historic structures in this district to um, help us make um, sound planning decisions um, to save those structures in the district in the future. Um, part of the uh, Part of the survey update effort includes creating an online map where anybody can go on and search their property for free to figure out if it's um, designated or if it's eligible for designation. We have the map up on our website now. Um, and as we survey districts throughout the city, we're going to input all of that data and constantly update it um, as we as we update our survey. So we've got a few points in there now relating to the old Bankhead Highway and um, I can't remember what the North-South high, Highway was called, but um, the original highway that ran east to west in, in the United States, um, which you can see here on the screen. So this will, be, this will be updated in about a year once the current phase is done with new data. And that's pretty much it. If you guys ever have questions about preservation or urban design projects, you can give uh, myself or Jamie or Lorelei a call or anyone else in the office. Um, we all we're all pretty much cross trained and we can cover for each other um, and you know we're, we're here to assist and, and answer questions. So um, that's it for us. Any questions on, on the presentation? I don't see any questions for the for you y'all, Justin. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. That historic that historic buildings um, predate the ADA, and do they have to comply with the ADA? Yes. So, um, if you are undertaking a rehab project, then you have to on a commercial structure. You have to provide ADA upgrades. Um, however. There are certain ways you can provide ADA upgrades on a historic building that um, are would be considered exceptions because you have to respect the historic character of that structure. So, you know, you may not be able to put a ramp right to the front entrance right in front of the building because um, that would be considered an adverse effect. You know, you may have to put in a chairlift on a, you know, a, a different entrance. So that folks can get into the building um, who who have um, uh, in that way. So you know we try and figure out a compatible solution from an ADA compliance standpoint. Um, it takes a little more time and effort to to work that out. But um, yeah, if it's a commercial structure, it does have to be brought up to ADA standards. Claire, I see your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to. Mentioned that there's some some specific items that come up in some of these historic areas related to floodplain development, um, and frequently there's a uh, an exemption for those historic structures to comply fully with the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, but some of the elevated uh, foundations would be really helpful in preventing flood damage in some of these areas too. So if there's new structures or something that needs to be improved, it'd be useful to kind of leverage that elevated foundation to keep those from uh, from flooding. Um, that wasn't the case in the stockyard where we, you, know, you couldn't elevate anything out there. And we did work with them because that area has been a, a historic region for, you know, forever uh, to try to develop in a, a way that's safe from flooding. But that's one of those things that we run into all the time where we have some sort of compatibility with uh, other regulations. We just want to make sure that we're probably involving y'all early in that process as well. Yeah, definitely. There's there's a, a lot of benefits to raised foundations, um, and, and that's that's one of them, especially in some of our historic districts that were built um, in, in floodplains, you know, because that's just where the growth happened, you know, 100 years ago. So.
Any other? Uh, looks like Armand had a question about lead and asbestos abatement. Um, our um, friends and neighborhood services, they actually have grants for lead abatement and um, not just in historic districts, but it's an income based program. And if you qualify and you live in your home, um, the city will will come and abate the lead on your property. So we work pretty closely with them on the projects in historic districts, and we actually have to review all HUD grants that come out of neighborhood services to make sure they meet preservation standards. I don't think there are funds specifically for asbestos abatement, but part of their priority repair program in neighborhood services includes um, removing asbestos tile in some instances and rehabbing original siding underneath. So um, it, it, it's um, they, they they do a lot of that work throughout the city, um, and um, it's, it it makes a big impact in a lot of our communities. Um, and then lastly, I don't think I had a slide on this, but we also review um, all city sponsored project on city owned infrastructure or property um, that is uh, over 50 years old as part of our administrative um, regulation A10 review process. So um, I know a lot of y'all work with um, departments that uh, such as TPW that do streetscape improvements. Um, or other infrastructure improvements throughout the city, especially in the core where we have older neighborhoods. And if there's a historic structure or historic resource that would be affected by the project, please give us a call in the early planning stages because we have to review that under city policy to make sure that that historic resource is protected and incorporated into the project. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, I just had one more question on the earlier slide where you buildings that had to be of some major renovations because they did not follow the plan that they filed. Um, is there anything in place to prevent it from getting to that point where they have to make these major renovations to these homes before they're almost done? There's no yeah, they, inspector or something that comes out and says, Hey, you're not following your plan and you need to make this change. Yeah, you know, and, and our inspectors are like the best way to make sure that they meet the plans, but also, you know, the the property or the contractor has to have the approved plans on site. And as long as they have those on site and they can read the plans that were approved, it usually cuts out some of that um some of these issues that we see, especially on new construction, you know, it, and it's also an education process. A lot of these contractors that come and build in our historic districts, they aren't used to having to, you know, really focus on details. They want to build a house, get in, get out, make a profit and go on to the next project. And when you have to spend a little bit more time making sure the details are correct, they don't always want to do that. So from our on from the city's end, we need to do a better job of getting out and educating our contractors and builders to make sure they know what they're getting into in, in these historic districts. So um, we're hoping to do more of that in the future now that we have some more, more staff coming in and more resources. Randy, you've got your hand up. Randy, did you want to share anything? It looks like you put a bunch of stuff in the chat. Um, any other questions? Well, thank you so much, everyone. Y'all have a good Friday. I appreciate everyone taking uh, taking the time to listen. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Thanks, Jamie. Um, hey, Justin. So that concludes the training. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts on a training they would like to hear for our next development review training meeting? By raise of hands.
No. DJ, do you have any final words of wisdom for the team? I've been called wise very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, no, again, I just want to say thank you guys for all the good work that you guys are doing. Uh, I, I really enjoy these trainings. They give us an opportunity to get a broader view of what we do in our department. We've got a whole lot of disciplines and everybody's working really hard in their own uh, discipline. And it's good to have an understanding of who to call and, and, and you know what to call on those folks for. Again, I know we have a lot of new folks in our ranks. So these, these trainings are all posted on the intranet. Uh, Dante can probably send out a link, you know, to the entire department or, you know, to show you guys where it is. All the presentations also are posted on that link. So if you don't have time to watch the entire video, you can just, you know, pull down the presentation and get the gist of it so that you can have a broader understanding.